everybody, George Kenner. Good to see you in my shop today. About a year ago, I purchased a Stepcraft M1000 CNC machine. And I knew that there was going to be a big learning curve along the way. I was really prepared for that. And one of the things that I just didn't understand, not that it factored into my purchase at all, was there was a design program called Vetric. And I knew that I was going to have to learn that. But I didn't understand that there was another program that sat behind there that is actually works, and I'm gonna use layman's terms, it acts like a switch to the machine. It will control the speed of the machine, um, it, it raises and lowers the spindle, it does that type of thing, it's called UC, C and C. What this is, is it's going to be the type of discussion that I had with Stepcraft when I was trying to learn the system. There were some things that I didn't realize that could be done, like adjusting what's called speed on the fly. And instead of going on more and more about this, I'm just gonna go straight and introduce you to Eric Royer, the CEO of Stepcraft. Now, if you like this kind of content, I'm gonna ask you to subscribe and like the video now. We're not gonna mention it again because it's just going to go into the tutorial that is about an hour long. This will really apply most to people that are either thinking of buying a Stepcraft or already have purchased one and they're looking for a little bit more information on the switch control system, UCCNC. Let's go to Eric. Okay, everybody, this is the second introduction. You're looking now at Eric Royer, the CEO of Stepcraft. He's agreed, as I've said, to show us UCCNC, the controller module for the um, M series that I purchased. And I think it controls all of the systems. Is that correct, Eric? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Every, uh, every machine that, that we sell uses the same software and all of the features and functions we offer uh, will work with this software. Okay, so I think really the best thing to do is probably throw our faces off to the side and open up UC, UCC and C and kind of go over the basics. Um, as I've told everybody already, it's really one of the reasons that I see this to be so valuable is that although we went through this when I initially purchased the machine, I didn't have a, a screen or a video um, to go back to and look at. So you've agreed to do this and I thank you very much for that. I hope it he helps all the people that either buy or um, already have a CCNC and need to, to brush up the UNCNC system. Okay. Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity to do this and uh, yeah, let's, let's do it. Do um, you want me to, I'll just kind of go through the basics it's first. Yours, it's yours. I, if, you if, I have any, if I have any questions, I'm going to jump in there and ask. Now, understanding you've been using your machine for a little while, ask me questions as if you're a ranked beginner too. Feel free to do that. Perfect. Um, it, won't, it won't discredit your knowledge that you've gained over the years, but for somebody who's brand new, I think the question, I, I tend to look over that stuff sometimes because I do this every day. So that'll be helpful. All right, so basically, um, here we are. We, this is the screen set for UCCNC. Um, now, UCCNC is a, is a base program that runs underneath this screen set, and we've customized this screen a lot for features and functions that we have for our CNC systems. So at first glance, to a lot of people, this can look pretty intimidating. Uh, there's an awful lot of buttons and numbers and things, and until you kind of go through it and you get used to it, 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 after a while, it becomes very simple because you're only focusing on what you need. Um, the software is broken down into a few different segments. Uh, this black window up here is where you'll see a preview of what project you're going to cut. The gray window below it is the you're going to see a live stream of G code as you're cutting. So you don't need to know G code, but you, you, they add this so that you could see the lines of G code going by. And if for some reason there was a problem, you can identify uh, based on that code if you wanted to. Uh, some people really like to kind of know what G-code does, you know, what, uh, how it affects what the machine's doing. Um, the section up here with all the numbers, uh, this is what we call the DRO or the digital readout. And any CNC machine, even if you go and look at like a million dollar, you know, CNC milling machine will have a digital readout. And what this is gonna do is this gives you some data based uh, that tells you where the actual gantry or the spindle on the machine is um, at, at, at a given point in time. 
Uh, and I'll go through the buttons on that, but this is what we can call the DRO section. There's a couple custom sections that we've added specifically for our machines. This section right here that has these graphics and the little square with the arrows and stuff, we have a 3D digitizing or 3D touch probe for our machines. And this, all of these buttons in here are used for that probe. Uh, so if, if you have a 3D touch probe and you want to find the center of a circle, the inside of a circle, you could simply touch this button and it'll go ahead and prompt you what to do next. Um, you can also use it to digitally scan an object if you wanted to, like, for instance, your mouse or something. You can set a 3D profile scan with that. So I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but maybe down the road, you and I might want to revisit that because there is a lot of features and functions there. Um, this little section in the middle right here, these six buttons are for our automatic tool changer. Now, one thing that sets StepCraft apart from a lot of our competitors is every single machine we sell, no matter how big or small, has an automatic tool changer option for it. Um, a lot, we have a lot of competitors that don't have an ATC at all uh, for their machines. And when you're running something that requires you know, two or more tool changes, having an automatic tool changer is, is really a key feature. And th these buttons here are utilized for that. So um, when I purchased my machine and I, I looked at the automatic tool changer and purchased one, but instead of running it in the code of the program, I just bought a bunch of collets and put all my end mills together so that I wouldn't have to every time take the wrench um, mm -hmm. to the spindle. So which one of these buttons is the automatic fast release? So all I have to do is change the collet. This button right here, the, it's ATC with a down arrow. Um, yeah. when you when you click on that a little window will pop up and it's this activates the manual release close for the uh, automatic tool changer so, so if, if you wanted to preset all of your end mills and you know your vcar bits or whatever you could literally set them in the container and just lift them out and quick load those you don't have to every time take a wrench to your machine yeah that's correct if you're if you have a tool rack on your machine which a lot of machines that so, so an automatic tool changer can be used two ways. It could be used as a fully automatic tool changer where you'd have a rack that you would store the tools uh, on your machine itself. And then you would train the software to, to what tool is in what position. Uh, and then in your, in your uh, G code or in your Vetrix software or whatever you're using for CAD CAM, you would assign a tool number to that particular operation that you wanna do and the machine will go get it. Um, the other way that you can use it, which I do both, I have a rack on the wall in our demo room that has probably 25 different tool holders. Each one is already set up with a particular tool that we use all the time. So if I have a quick job that I need to cut like a circle and I don't need to set up a whole program or the automatic tool changer, I can simply take that tool, hit the button on the machine, pop the tool holder in and I'm done. I, I don't have to worry about using a wrench or anything like that because I've already got it set up on a tool holder. So you, you can use it as kind of a quick change, uh, manual quick tool change feature too. Uh, and usually there is a button on, uh, depending on the machine, there'll be a button somewhere that will activate that as well. So it, it's like a mechanical button that takes the place of this button on the screen. Um, so that's, that's how that would work. Yeah, that's the way that I... Uh... I use mine more frequently that way than any other way, just yep. as a quick change. And I love that. Me too. I, I do too. Unless I'm running something that I'm, you know, like if I was doing a cabinets out of a four by eight plywood, um, a cabinet might have three tool changes. If I'm going to do something like that, I will set it up with the, the automatic tool changer. Um, but if I'm doing just a one-off thing, it's easier to just pop tools in as I need them. So uh, there's a button here called offsets, which is kind of cool. Uh, what you do here is if you're using an automatic tool changer, you could set up, say your job has five different tools. You put those tools on the tool rack on your machine, one through five, or it doesn't really matter what position they're in. When you click on this button, it's going to basically tell you that this macro is going to automatically adjust the tool offsets. And when you click OK, it's going to ask you how many tools are on the ATC. So if, if you want to do five different tools, you, you would type in five and it would then go to, um, 
Uh, this is going to give me an error now because I don't have an ATC on this machine. Um, okay, so what it'll do is it'll it'll pick up tool number one and it'll measure it on the tool length sensor. Then it'll put it back. Then it'll grab tool number two and it'll measure it on the tool length sensor. And what it's doing is it's taking tool number one, which is your reference tool. So that's always going to be zero. And it'll measure every other tool in the rack to see whether that tool sticks out further or is higher up than tool number one. And it stores that information in an offset um, in a tool table here. So you'll see tool number one will always say zero, but tool number two might say negative, whatever, or tool number three might be positive. And that data is stored in UCC and C forever until you change it. So if you have a 10 tool rack on your machine, maybe tools one through five are the tools you use all the time. But, and then six through 10 are kind of special tools that you need occasionally. So that way, when you're sitting in your office and you're programming a job, you know that tool number one is always a quarter inch compression end mill on your machine. You, you know all the time, that's all you have to do. And, and UCC and C will sync up with that. So, so it's, it's, you, you said something and I, I'm thinking like a beginner or just somebody that's thinking about purchasing one of these machines. Mm -hmm. If I had a four by eight sheet of plywood and a Q series, which I think is one of your largest machines, I'd be operating in the same system, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Same okay. software. Now, now you have a D series update, correct? Yeah. Our new D3 series just launched a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Okay. It runs off the same system. Exactly the same. So if I learned this, I could literally take and expand or take the basics into a machine shop and do basically the same thing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yep. So in a way, what you're doing by learning this is teaching yourself skill. That's correct. Yeah, that's one good way of, of looking at it. Because, you know, as, if you're with our brand, you could start with a very small tabletop machine. And even with that tabletop machine, you could add a tool changer, a touch probe, or any of the other features and functions we offer. Um, but then if you decided, hey, your business really took off and you want to get a four by eight foot machine, this screen is identical, nothing changes. Um, the only thing that changes is if you see on the screen right here, it says profile, this is a Stepcraft D300 that I have this connected to right now. Um, that profile would simply change for whatever machine you're running. And in that profile, what, what the profile is, is it's telling the software the parameters of that machine. So basically how much X, Y, and Z travel you have for that particular machine. Um, and that's it. That's the only thing that changes. And that, that happens in the background. You don't even have to do anything to fix that. Okay. So, yeah, One of the, I'm sorry to interrupt. One that's of great. the other things that um, I ran in, in, I didn't run into this problem. I got it quickly corrected with Craig, was I had heard uh, another big guy in CNC that teaches Vetric. And he says the thing that he loved about his machine is though it was unique was that he could adjust the speed on the fly. So he's cutting a material and he decides that he's just not cutting at the right speed, either too fast or too slow, and he wants to adjust it. Can I do that on this machine? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You can adjust two things on here. So this orange bar, this top orange bar, it says F set. F set is your feed rate. So that's how fast your end mill is moving through your material. And if, if there was a job in here right now, this, that would, you would, you'd be running that job at 600 millimeters a minute. And that's, that's basically what that, that feed rate is talking about. F active is how fast it's actually running. So if you think of it this way, this is your cruise control. You've said it, that this is the maximum speed you want to cut for that job. But when you go through a corner or you have to change directions, your speed's going to slow down and then, and then increase again. And this one here is your speedometer. So this is telling you how, how actually how fast the machine is going. And normally we set jobs up to always run at 100%. So if I was going to start a job and I was going to get a new end mill from say, we were an Amana dealer. So say I just got a brand new end mill from Amana. I may not know what the feeds and speeds for that end mill should be. So I'll look at their, their, their webpage and they're going to tell me how fast, how many RPMs, how, how, what the feed rate should be for that end mill. And I'm going to program my job with that as a starting point. Now, 
you know, they're going to say hardwood. So there, so as an example, they might say run this end mill at 100 inches a minute through hardwood. So I may have a piece of oak, you may have a piece of walnut. Those are very different hardwoods. So I'll, I'll set it up at 100%. But as I as the job is running, I'll be listening to it. I'm like, you know what, that doesn't sound very good. It's squealing. Maybe I got to slow it down. I can just hit this minus button right here. And that's going to slow it down to 70% of the speed that the job is set at. So if it was set to 100 inches a minute, now it's going to run at 70 inches a minute. Or I can increase it because sometimes you're, you're listening and, and there's no strain on the machine. Like it, like the machine has extra power to give. Um, and you could, you can conversely, you can increase it. So now I'd be running at 130 inches per minute or 130% of what it was originally set for. And a lot of times when you're setting up new tools, you're listening, you know, it's cause you're not seeing a lot. I mean, obviously if you see smoke, you've got a dull end mill and you're, you're really pushing it hard. You should stop. But a lot of it is listening. You, you want to listen to see what it sounds like. Is the machine straining? Does it sound like it's cutting really well? And then you analyze your chips. You want to make sure you have nice, clean chips when you're cutting and not a pile of dust that looks like an anthill. Um, you want to have chips. So you can adjust that feed rate to optimize your job running. And the second bar of that is S set. And what S set is, is the RPMs. So that's if you have a computer controlled spindle, like our MM1000DI or, or any of our computer spindles, you can vary the RPM here as well. So if you set a job up to run at 15,000 RPM and maybe it sounds like it's running too fast, you can, you can again, just slow the RPMs down uh, while it's live. So what I'll do a lot, just a, a hint for people, if I'm, if I'm running a, a new material with an end mill that I use all the time, or if I'm running a new end mill or material I run all the time, I'm gonna start with the manufacturer's settings and I'm gonna run the job. And then I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna listen to it. I'm gonna optimize it by changing these numbers. As soon as I'm done with the job, I'll look at these numbers to see where I have it set at the end of that. Then I'll go into my tool library in Vetrix specifically, and I will readjust my settings for that tool with that material because the new Vetric allows you to assign a machine and the material for that particular tool. So for instance, if I was running this job and I'm, I, I know that I could be 120% of whatever I had it set for. So I would go in and I would make that a change and I would change my RPM to 70% of what I had it set for. So now the next time I run that job or that material with that tool, I'm gonna leave these both set at 100 because I already did the work ahead of time to optimize my library for my machine. So these, these values are really cool that you can adjust them on the fly, but if you take it a step further and you build your custom library based on optimized settings while you're running a job, uh, you know, you'll get to a point where your machine is just gonna run flawlessly. Every time you pick up a tool, it's, it's everything is optimized for you. So, again, for the absolute beginner, somebody that's just buying, they're going to go into Vetric and set up their program. They're going to go in and select their tool and tool path. Then th that's going to be established. With some systems, you're locked into what you have set in that program from Vetric. But here, after you've set your tool path, um, along with the, the end mill that you selected or whatever VCARV, uh, whatever your end mill is, you can go in and, and change it. That's correct. So, that, so that's not unique to any one brand and is something can be done on all your machines. Yeah, correct. I mean, it's, you know, most, most CNC machines uh, that I know of will have some sort of override for your, your, your feed rate and your RPM uh, to adjust them, you know, on the fly. As, as another example, as a beginner, right, we're talking about beginners. So, when you run your first job, I mean, you know, you did it um, kind of nervous. You get nervous, right? You, it's something new. I still get nervous. <laughs> yeah, I do too, to be honest with you. I'm going to hit start and as I wait a minute, I can give I, it another. I, I do too, especially if I'm going to like aluminum. Like not turn on my spindle. but <laughs> So what you could do on a, in a case like that, when you're starting with something new, um, you, you could set your job up to run with the optimum settings that the manufacturer is suggesting, right? 
But what I'll do a lot of times, if it's something brand new, is before I hit cycle start to start my job, I'll lower this down to like 10 or 20 percent. And I will go ahead and, and I'll run the job. I'll hit cycle start. And as my job is running, I see it moving really, really slow. And when it lands down on the material exactly where I want it and it starts cutting and it gets to its first pass depth. And if I set it to a quarter inch and it looks like it's cutting a quarter inch, then I get a little bit more comfortable. Like, OK, I, I didn't mess up my initial Z height setting. And so then I'll bump the speed up maybe to like 40 or 50 percent. And then I'll watch the job run for a minute or two. And I'm like, yep, okay, this is perfect. It's running the way it's supposed to. And then I'll bring it up to a hundred percent and I'm confident. So, so this, even, even after all these years of me doing this, I still use this F set when I start something brand new, just as a checking point to make sure I didn't mess something up inadvertently when I programmed it. Okay. So you're out in the garage, everything's going perfectly. And all of a sudden, somebody, your wife, girlfriend comes running in and says, hey, I got to have you right now. And you don't want to leave the machine running. You're only a third of the way through the job. What do I do? So what you can do on this machine is you can do um, you have two options. You could do a cycle stop. I usually don't recommend that if it's just going to be an intermediate thing where, you, you know, dinner's ready and you got to go inside and eat. I won't cycle stop because then you've got to go ahead and cycle start again. And you'd have to go back a few lines in the G code. It, it leaves you victim to making a mistake that could ruin your job. So what I do is if I had to pause the job, I click feed hold. And as soon as you click feed hold, this light starts blinking. And what it'll do is it'll stop the machine from moving. Now, the problem is it stops the machine from moving, but it does not shut the, the uh, spindle off. So your machine will stop moving, but you're still going to run in the air at 16,000 RPM or whatever you have it set to. And that's not ideal. So then the next thing I do is I click this button right here. And this is our spindle um, on and off button. And so once you hit feed hold, you can click this button and it will actually turn the spindle off. If you have a computer controlled spindle, if you have a manual spindle, you can click feed. Like if you were using, say, a DeWalt router or something, you can click feed hold and then go ahead and just turn the spindle off. Now you go have dinner and you come back. You, it's important that when you come back, you do this in the opposite that you started it in. So the very first thing you're gonna do is hit this button again to turn your spindle back on. And then you'll go ahead and hit feed hold and the job will just carry on like it, like it did. So it's a two button process, but in my opinion for like pausing for, you know, an hour or whatever you need to do. That is the optimal way to do it. Um, and you guarantee that your job's not going to get messed up when you start. Um, but you have to make sure you turn that spindle back on. Otherwise the machine is going to start moving and the cutter's not spinning and you're going to have a problem. So feed hold and then spindle off. And then when you come back, spindle on and then feed hold again, and you're good to go. Perfect. Yeah. So it's cool. Cool little feature. Um, so we have some other features in here too. So that, that I think are neat. Maybe you do or, or don't know about them at this point. You know how like when you program a job in Vetric, it's going to ask you for your X, Y datum, where is your start position? And most people program either to the front of the machine left side corner or to the center of the job. So what we did here was we, we have two buttons here that do just that. So if you are running a job that you program to start in the lower left or front left corner, you can click on this M0 button. And what it does is it'll automatically um, move the um, gantry to the front left corner of the machine. So now you could position your material to where the end mill is and it brings it right into that, that area. Um, if you're running a job that you're going to run from the center, uh, same thing. You just hit this button. It knows the X, Y maximum for your machine. It does the calculation. It puts that spindle right in the middle of your table. So now you could take your piece of material. You could put it right under the end mill, line it up exactly where you want, and then fasten it down. Uh, so these two buttons are very, very handy for, um, for, or for things like that. Another example that I use these for is if you're doing, and this is more, a little more advanced, 
But if you're doing a job that's repetitive, like say you're making signs uh, for Etsy sales or something, and at once a week you get 10 signs, you, you know, you batch them out and you, you do all your orders on one day. If you set up a fixture or a stop on your machine, you can do that based on the position that the machine lands in when you hit either one of these buttons. So it's repeatable. So for instance, if I hit this M0 top one, it moves me to the front left corner of the machine. If I wanted to go ahead and then screw down a fixture that gave me a left edge and maybe a bottom edge so I could take my, my sign blanks and put them in the machine and they're in the exact same spot every time, I can set up my zero position for that fixture based on pressing this button because it's a known value on the machine. And you could do the same thing with the center. So these, these have, as you progress and as you, you start to get involved in different things, it becomes really handy to have something that automatically puts you in a very specific known location on the machine so that you can you know, further uh, program your job or run your job from there. Um, so that's these two buttons. This, this bottom button is, for me, it's, it's one I use probably the most. Um, I use it on our, four, our 408 machine, our big machine, a lot. And all this does is pick up the spindle moves the gantry to the absolute back of the machine in the center. So if I had a, a piece of three quarter inch plywood that I just got through cutting a bunch of parts for a cabinet and the job is finished, now I've got to take all those parts off the machine. But if the gantry stopped in the middle or if it stopped in the front, it's in my way. So all I have to do is hit this button and it moves everything to the back of the machine. Now I have the entire table free for me to unload my parts and clean it up and get ready to run another sheet. So for the, for the new person, when you set your home and let's say you did it on the center of the piece, mm -hmm. when the job is finished, it goes back to the home position. Correct, it'll go right back to where you're so Now you've got it in the middle of your piece and you wanna lift the piece off. All you have to do is hit, um, hit that, that button. back and it just clears it out and actually takes you very close to your home position. Yep. Perfect. And because these were so useful, we ended up putting three user buttons next to it that you could, this is, this would be considered more advanced. You could change the, uh, there's a file, a macro file um, on the, on your computer that you could change and assign a very specific XYZ position to each of these. So if you were running, um, you know, specific fixtures and things like that, you could use these buttons to get you exactly where you need to be each time. Um, so that's that's something unique that we put on. And these are not features you'll find on other machines. These are ones that are pretty specific to what we're doing because because um, we wanted them, we needed them. Uh, the other thing we can do on our DRO over here, you've got the DRO is split into two sections. So you have your zeroing buttons over here and then you have your homing buttons. So anybody that has a machine, I don't care whose machine it is, when you turn it on for the first time in the day, or even if you didn't power it off last night or whatever, the first thing I do is click home all. Before I start running anything, I wanna make sure that my machine goes to its, its limits and homes off against a limit switch, a mechanical switch, so that my machine knows exactly where it is before I start using it. And there's a button here called machine. And when you click it, it turns red and these numbers over here will change. What that's for is when it turns red, these numbers represent the actual machine coordinates of where the gantry is in reference to it homing. So if you home your machine, um, these numbers are either gonna be positive or negative, but it'll, they'll probably read zero, zero, and then maybe the Z is uh, 30 millimeters or something like that. That is your, that every time you hit home all, you're going to go to a limit switch. And then these figures, as long as this button is red, are going to be what the actual machine limit switches locations are. Um, you don't normally keep this button on, but again, if um, you needed to bring the machine to a very specific location, you're, you can do it based on um, looking at this, uh, this button right here and moving the machine accordingly. Once you home your machine, you turn this button off. Now the numbers are called user numbers. Now, now at this point, as you move your machine, like I'm moving this one now, those numbers are all gonna change. 
So when I bring my job to my uh, a specific location, like for instance, if I, on this particular one, I'm in the middle of the machine right now. And if I wanna zero my job right here, all I have to do at this point is just click zero all. And even though my machine coordinates, these represent where the hard numbers are on the machine, this is my user coordinates. So for all intents and purposes, when you start running your job, these are the numbers that your file that you created in Vetric is gonna to use to run the job. Um, and that, so that's, that's the, the zero all uh, when you're in user coordinates. Now, say I did that, like right now, I, I, my spindle is actually in the air, but if I wanted to go ahead and I wanted to lower my spindle so that the end mill touches the surface of my material, I can do that by hitting page down and you can see my Z is gonna go negative. As soon as I set it up to touch the turf surface of my material, I don't have to hit zero all again. I can just zero Z by itself. So that's what these buttons are. They represent zeroing each axis individually. And also, and so that, that's, that's what those are. And it's, and it, it's kind of nice because sometimes, I'll give you an example. Let's just say I'm running this job and I zeroed my Z and I didn't calculate something correctly and I hit a clamp and I broke my end mill. Well, I don't want to readjust my X, Y because my material is already fastened on the machine. So I don't want to ruin that material. So I'm going to take it, I'm going to change my end mill. I'm going to put a new end mill in, but now I didn't put the height of the end mill in the exact position it was previously. So I'm going to have to lower it down and re-zero my Z. So at that point, I can just, you know, raise and lower my, my machine and then just hit the Z zero and continue on with my job. It's, it's nice and simple. Um, because it's very important that when you're running a job, if something were to happen, that you do not um, readjust your X and Y. As soon as you do that, uh, then you've lost your starting position on that material. And essentially that material becomes garbage at that point because there's no way of relining it back up. Okay, so um, you had just mentioned, I hit page down and that will adjust my Z height, correct? Correct, yeah. Where else, on the, where else in the program can I move the gantry? Okay, so on your keyboard, the, the arrow keys, left, right arrow keys are gonna move X, uh, left and right. Up and down arrow keys are gonna move Y front to back and page up, page down is your Z axis. Now, if, you, if you're using a touch screen or for some reason, I don't know, maybe your keyboard's not close to you and you have a mouse, you can come over here and you can do the same thing. These three arrows, as soon as you move your mouse over here, uh, you can go in and, and I can move my Z or my Y just by hitting this button here. Um, I don't use these buttons a lot. I find it easier to use the keyboard, uh, to be honest with you. Um, but what I do come over to this panel from time to time in is to change the jog speed. So right now, when I press the arrow key, I'm moving at 10% of that machine's maximum speed. Uh, I, if I want to move it faster, I can certainly do that. And now my machine's going to move a lot quicker and you could see the number, you know, the numbers change a lot faster. Um, however, if I'm working on something that's more precise and I want to be super careful when I'm moving my arrow keys that I'm not moving too fast, I mean, I can lower the jog speed down a lot and now I'm moving, you know, millimeters every couple seconds, you know, so 10% is usually where we keep it as a default, but you have the ability to change the jog speed that whether you're using these buttons or the keyboard, uh, using this here. So what I've used this for, especially when point down the jog speed is when I'm setting my Z. Sometimes if I'm using a piece of paper instead of uh, one of the touch off devices. Yep. Yeah, so then you can slow it down. down to little as one and just make sure that I've got it as, as accurately set as I possibly can. So another tip for you that you may or may not know, um, if you hold the shift key, on your keyboard and use the mouse, or I'm sorry, the shift key and the arrow, arrow keys or the page up, page down, it's automatically going to move at 100%. So mm -hmm. right now your arrow keys are going to move at whatever the jog speed is set. But if you hold the shift, it's going to go right to 100%. Also, if you hold the control key, 
it's now moving step by step. So if I hold the control key, if you look at the X axis number up in the DRO here right now, I'm holding the control key. You see how small of an increment I'm moving? I'm, I'm moving in hundreds of a millimeter. Mm -hmm. um, this allows me to really make precise adjustments uh, on my machine. Uh, and there are times where that does come in handy. So, you know, shift lets you move nice and fast and then control moves step by step. So you've got 300 steps per rotation. Each time you push that, it's one step. So I theoretically, I put my Z axis down too fast, too hard, and my reset came on. Okay. Okay. So, and I can't really figure out what's wrong. Where do I go? Like to the diagnostics panel to the top to see which one of my things is. Yeah, you could do that. You could, if you go into diagnostics, you'll see right here, you've got your limit switches uh, for X, uh, X, Y, Z. Um, if, you, if you hit a limit, and I can't really simulate that here, one of these lights will come on. So it'll tell you that you've got a, a limit uh, problem. Your, your x-axis limit switch is stuck, for instance. Um, if, you're, if you look at your machine and your gantry is in the middle and you've got an x-axis limit switch on or your y-axis limit switch on, chances are you have something stuck in the switch itself. Maybe some junk got in there or whatever. If you look and your gantry is all the way to the left or your y is all the way to the back and your limit switch is on, chances are you lost steps somewhere and the machine kind of lost its ability to count where it is. Um, you know, these, most of these machines are not servo driven. So there is no direct feedback loop to tell the machine where it is or to do like a, a good double check. So if your software is telling your machine to move 10 inches and it moves five inches and then hits a clamp, it's going to stall but the machine, the software still thinks it went 10 inches, even though it only went five. So when you go to run your machine to the back now, you're, you physically run out of space, but the software is like, what's going on? I still have five more inches to go. And that's when you'll catch a limit switch. That's the point of those limit switches. It's so that you don't break your machine. Um, when, when that limit switch is tripped, it's a hard stop. And if you don't know which one it is, you could just go into diagnostics and you can see. Um, conversely, you can also see the e-stop. So, uh, you'll, you'll know that if, if you were in e-stop mode, like right now, if I e-stop my machine, the reset button goes on and all of a sudden a green light appears. If I take the e-stop off, that light turns off and then I can hit reset and continue on. And for absolute beginners, the e-stop is the red panic button that you hit on the, yeah. if something's going wrong. It's the uh-oh button. Yeah. Yeah, um, when, I, when I edit this, I'm going to put a picture of the e-stop on. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that, that'd be good. I, I'd appreciate that. Um, let's see what else we talked about the zeroing. Now this side is homing. So I told you every time you use the machine, you should home all, uh, no matter what. Um, sometimes it's only necessary to home one axis. Like for instance, if you were moving your gantry and, uh, from left to right, and you hit an obstruction and it stalled your, uh, your gantry from moving in the X direction, you could clear the obstruction and then simply just home that particular axis. And it's just gonna move over until it hits the limit switch and then it's gonna zero itself out. So that now it knows like minus 103.5 on this machine, that is where the limit switch is um, on, on, or on this particular job. So, you, you know, you have the ability to home everything, which, you know, on a small machine is not a big deal, but if you're working on a four by eight foot machine and you hit home all, and that gantry is in the front right corner, it has to move to the back left corner and it does it really slowly. So it wastes time. Um, you could, you could simply just rehome that particular axis. So that's what these buttons are for. Um, and then I think offline, you'd ask me about the double home all, mm -hmm. um, and what is that for? What we do on double home all is we will do a home all and the machine moves at 10% to the limit switch and then it records its position. That's its hard, fast home. When you do double home all, it, it moves at 10% to the limit switch. Then it moves away from the switch slightly and goes at 1% 
speed until it hits the limit switch again. So think of it like a double check. Now it's taking the reading from the first time it hit the limit switch and it recorded where in, in machine mode, where it was at, and then it hits the limit switch again, very, very slowly. And it double checks to make sure that both of those numbers are the same. So it, it's, it's a way for you to guarantee that you have a perfectly accurate homing position on your machine. Um, it's not something I use on a regular basis, but if I was doing uh, like an aluminum part or something, it was very, very precise and I had to reset the job up or something, I might want to use a double home all to ensure that my location is, you know, on aluminum, you know, if you're off uh, 10 thousandths, you're going to see it. So, but on wood, you may never see 10 thousandths. So it just, it just depends, but that's, that's what that button does. It just gives you a super accurate homing location. Okay. I can't really think of much more to ask right now. It's my understanding that you're working on a tutorial series for this. Yeah, so I am, I've started, um, we're about a third, a third of the way through um, taking everything kind of like I just told you in this video, um, but doing a very structured online course. So there will be probably 40 videos, but the videos will be short. So for instance, the video on how to use home all, I mean, how much time can I really talk about home all? Um, but then there'll be a video that talks about how to use the offsets for the automatic tool changer. That one might be a little longer. So then you can pick and choose which videos you want to watch based on what you're trying to do. Perfect. Um, it's something we, we, we've talked about doing for a long time. We've been making a lot of modifications to this screen set over the last six months. And we really wanted to make sure everything was dialed in and all of our programming and the graphics were right because it's a real pain to have to redo a course when you add a new button or you change a color or something like that. So now we're in a good place to do that. Um, hey, real quick, just a side thing. Do you know what the, have you used the G54 through 59 buttons yet? I have not. Okay. Do you know what they do? No. Cool. So this is a, here's a good like beginner to intermediate. The G buttons are what's called a work coordinate system. Okay. And what's neat about that is let's just say on my machine, I'm going to move it to the center and I'm going to set up a job there in the center. So I'm going to zero all, and that's going to be my center location. Right. And I have that on G54. And I, right now I'm zeroed to the center of the machine. Now I finished that job, but I know I've got to run more. Like I, I've got six signs. I'm waiting for a customer to give me an okay on two more, but I don't, while I'm waiting for them, I could be running something else somewhere else on the machine. So what you could do is you could then turn around and go to G55 and you could say, okay, now I want to move my new start position is going to be to the front left corner of the machine. So your machine is going there. Now I'm going to home, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to zero that. So G55 right now is zeroed at the front left of my machine. G54 is zeroed on the center of my machine. So I finish my job on the front left and then my customer calls and says, hey, I'm ready to place an order for that sign, right? You're like, oh, okay, cool. So you finish that job, you go back over to G54 and then just go to, um, go to zero. And um, yeah, forget that. So now what it's gonna happen is it's gonna move to the center of the machine again, or wherever your G54 location is. You could think of it like having six different machines, essentially, if you wanted to. Um, you can have six different zero positions on your machine bed, and you can bounce back and forth between them. Another, another good use for like in machining world, let's say you had something you were machining, you had two vices on your machine to clamp apart. You could have vice on the vice on the left could be G54 for its zero position. And the vice on the right could be G55. And so you could bounce back and forth really quickly to your zeros simply by pushing that button and then doing go to zero. So it's, it's called a work coordinate system. A lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people don't realize, well, what would I even use that for? But once you know it exists, depending on the, how you're using the machine, if you're doing production stuff or 
you know, doing it for business purposes, this becomes very, very handy to, to be able to set multiple zero positions and, uh, and recall them really quickly. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to end this with two little things. Sure. One, it's my understanding you've been editing something for a lot of hours just in the last day. What is it? So we have our, our M series machine, which is our middle of the line machine. Um, that and our new D series machines are sold in kit form. Uh, so you can have us assemble it as a ready to run, or we would sell it to you as a kit and you would have to put it together. Our manuals are very, in my opinion, I, I'm biased, but uh, they're very, very well done. They're, they're, um, they're, the illustrations are good. They're easy to follow, but there are some people that learn better um, by watching somebody do it. So what we ended up doing was we recorded every single step in the manual. We recorded a video uh, for that and we put it online as a structured assembly course. So this particular course has, I think, 93 videos. There was 93 steps in the manual. So um, you get your machine faster and cheaper if you put it together yourself, right? Yeah, you save about five, $600 uh, to do it yourself. And shipping is gonna be cheaper because typically it can go by UPS because it's in a box with parts. But once we build it, it has to go in a crate. So it has to go by freight company. So you save a little bit on the shipping too. And um, the D series, give me three reasons I need a new D series. <laughs> Well, if you're a beginner um, and you're looking to get your first CNC machine, one of the if you only had a smaller budget, let's just say a two thousand dollar budget is what you want to spend. Um, the only things that are really available in that price range are going to be belt driven machines, and the new D series has no belts. It's a complete lead screw driven um, precision roller guide bearing roller guide system. It's all hardened steel. Um, we do not use any off the shelf uh, frame or structure components on our machines. Everything that we manufacture, if you look at any aluminum part on our machine, we manufacture a custom die and all of those parts are custom extruded just for us. So when you start looking at inexpensive machines, you're gonna find that they're belt driven. You're gonna find that they use material that's very common like 80-20 extrusion that you could buy online anywhere. Uh, and they simply make brackets and they screw it together like a, a rector set type thing. When you get into a Stepcraft machine, um, you're buying something that's highly engineered. And the new D series, while it might be a couple hundred dollars more than say a belt driven competitor, you're getting a machine that the latest accuracy test I did was we had like a four ten thousandths repeatability um, on a desktop machine. Like nobody does that. Uh, so it was, it, it is an extremely rigid machine for a, uh, I, I want to call it an entry level. I hate using that term, but that's like our beginner or price wise, our beginner level from a price standpoint, um, machine aluminum all day long, aggressively machine aluminum. The, it's just super, super rigid. Um, a lot of improvements were made over the old D series. It's a dual motor on Y. Now the motors are all bigger. Um, it's faster, uh, it's much more rigid machine. And we, we, you know, that was our first machine. The D series is nine, almost nine years old now. So it was time that we, we did a, a kind of a reboot on it and, um, it's, it's a completely new design and, and yeah, we're really proud of it. It's, uh, it's and we're finally getting, and we should have stock finally to start shipping next week. So we're excited about that too. Good for you. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you very much. I know everybody out there that is interested in UCCNC and even getting a little Stepcraft Insight information has been very helpful to me, and I hope it's helpful to anybody that gets to see this video. Thank you for all you do for us. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, George. I appreciate it. Keep up the good work on all your videos. Thank you. You have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.